Buonasera a tutti o buongiorno a seconda del, dell'orario a cui ci ascoltate. Um, siamo uh, qui con uh, Roxanne uh, Azadi uh, per uh, una puntata in cui parleremo delle proteste che si sono, che si sono verificate in Iran negli ultime, nelle ultime settimane. Uh, Roxanne è uh, un'esperta di Medio Oriente, in particolare di Iran, che è un paese che uh, conosce in maniera molto approfondita, in cui ha vissuto e ha viaggiato uh, a lungo, è perfettamente fluente in farsi e conosce molto bene la storia e, il, um, e, e la cultura uh, del paese, è anche una uh, contributor sul uh, settimanale um, Ukraine's Katijden, uh, di Ukrainian Week, e um, le abbiamo chiesto, non compare, eh, preferisce non comparire per ragioni di sicurezza personale, per la possibilità di continuare ad andare in Iran in un futuro e per non mettere in, in pericolo, in difficoltà se, o alt se stessa o altri per il tipo di, di lavoro che fa. Ehm, L'idea di questa puntata è di eh, dare un po' un contesto storico e politico a quanto sta succedendo in Iran. Ovviamente tutti quanti siamo inondati di immagini, di notizie e non sempre è facile mettere insie metterle insieme, uh, la maggior parte dei casi perché non conosciamo a sufficienza l'Iran o lo uh, conosciamo molto poco, io incluso, e uh, quindi l'idea di questa puntata è di, dare, uh, di cercare di dare una, um, un contesto che ci può aiutare a capire quanto vediamo e, um, e che ruolo abbiano le proteste che stanno, che stanno svolgendo oggi in Iran nella storia recente uh, iraniana. Um, la puntata sarà in inglese. E... Roxanne, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yeah, as I was saying in Italian, um, uh, the idea of the episode is, you know, um, Most people have a very basic understanding of Iran. Most people know very, very little about, it, about Iran, myself included. So uh, since we are, we've been inundated with, you know, with information, with images, with news, um, the idea of this episode is to try and give us a bit of context so that we can understand better what's going on and understand what's happening, what's not happening, what are the misconceptions that you know it's easy to to make about what mm -hmm. what's happening and in that sense i would start asking you from you know before the beginning of the protests on september 16th i would start to by asking you um can you kind of set up for us what the political and social climate was in Iran before the beginning of this protest, so that we understand mm -hmm. how we got there. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Well, I'll probably have to start that um, uh, Iran has been a very, uh, you know, tightly controlled country since the revolution in 1979. Um, some people call it a sort of totalitarian state with the elements of autocratic regime and indeed Iran even though it's a democracy on a paper because people can elect the president people can elect the parliament uh, regardless of that it's uh, you can say one man state and uh, politically most of the things are decided by the supreme leader uh, I'll explain the difference so Unlike many states where you have a president um, and let's say prime minister, Iran doesn't have it. They have a, a what is called Rahbar, a supreme leader. He is responsible for mm, foreign policy. Uh, he's uh, in command of uh, Iranian army. He appoints a head of judiciary and I would say most of the power uh, is in the hands of supreme leader. A uh, president who is elected, uh, he, he signs off on the foreign decrees. Um, his role is very, very, I would say, uh, for, formal. Um, uh, I would also say that in terms of political climate, Iran 
doesn't have any sort of uh, opposition as we're used to that in the West. Um, so there is no, let's say, swap between the opposition parties and the ruling parties after the elections. Um, <clears throat> as such, any deviation from the system, which is generally called Nezam, uh, which is the regime uh, in Farsi, um, any deviations from this system are punishable by law and there are no parties who would, for example, suggest to modify the system, to change the system, uh, or anything like that. Um, of course, within the political establishment, there are different um, fractions, as we could we could we could call it that way. Uh, there are reformists who advocate for more more of a open foreign policy, less restrictions at home, um, and of course more interaction with the world and of, and of course there are conservatives who who advocate for um, very little interaction with the outside world very strict uh, internal policies um, and they for example the current president who is uh, Ibrahim Raisi he is uh, one of the conservatives his predecessor who is Rouhani uh, he was part of the so-called reformists and uh, when Rouhani actually was elected uh, in 2013, a lot of people hoped that he would, of course, he wouldn't change the system, but everyone hoped that maybe he could start a gradual change. And of course, those ho hopes, hopes, they failed, and that partially contributed to um, uh, moods and attitudes in the society that we can see today. Um, I would probably also have to tell you about the laws, um, especially when it comes to the um, hijab laws or the dress I code. Be there for a, for a second, just 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 to clarify for for yeah. you know, listening to us. So, as you mentioned, you know, there's a president uh, Raisi who was elected uh, not. Many years mm -hmm. ago, I think, like uh, two years ago, something like that. Could that be actually last summer, so 2021. Okay, uh, and he's elected directly by uh, the people by by yeah. voters, right? And then there is a parliament that is also elected by the people. Yeah. Um, it, one, you know, possibly silly question: How free are those elections? Like, I know it sound, probably sounds like a silly question, but uh, well, I guess when you ask the question how free, uh, for example, um, not everyone can um, participate in elections. So to participate in election and to run for president, you have to be vetoed by uh, several institutions, for example, um, like the Guardian Council. And uh, the same with the members of the parliament, if you want to run, it's not that you reach a certain age and if you're popular, you can get elected. Uh, you have to be vetoed by the government institution. So it's a sort of a vicious cycle where uh, you vote for elect for um, foreign institutions and those institutions tell you whether people who run for it can actually run. Right. So that creates so, sort of a, a illusion of democracy where you vote, but you are you can only vote for people who you're told you can vote for. And of course, uh, again, there are no opposition parties, so there is no, um, let's say, an opposition leader who can run for president. It's basically the same people from the same system with the slightly different views on mostly foreign policy and internal policies. Right. So essentially, you know, th there's this system that kind of uh, gives you this illusion that, you know, you can vote, but, you know, the, the choice yes. is very limited. And it's yes. limited by these, uh, by what you call this, the Guardian Council, which yes. obviously is not elected. Uh, I and, and then there is this other figure, the Supreme Leader, um, Khamenei, I think, is is um, the way you pronounce it. I could be wrong. Khamenei. 
Okay, yeah. Khomeini. Khomeini is the so the first supreme leader who was uh, you know leader of the Islamic yeah. Revolution forty years ago. He was a uh, Khomeini. The current one is Khomeini, so it's yeah. pretty easy, it's easy to, 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 make them to, to stop them. And it's important to to notice that the current um, supreme leader has been in office since 1989. Yeah, he's uh, one of the longest uh, ser serving leaders in the Middle East. And uh, yeah, except for the Iranian previous Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, uh, Khamenei is one of the longest serving ruler, if you want to call that, uh, in Iranian current modern history. Right. Um, sorry if I jumped in on this, but I think you know it, it's very interesting to understand. Very interesting to understand, and I think most people wouldn't, you know, wouldn't necessarily be familiar with this. So, so that's that's very good to know. And uh, but you were obviously moving on to talk about what's, you know, uh, the legal framework. Um, that... I guess I also sorry I'm interrupting you. I guess one more thing that's very important to mention is that the turnout in the Iranian election has been extremely low and the only time when the turnout was high uh, or the past 10 years was in 2013 when the reformist Rouhani was elected uh, then when he was re-elected the turnout was pretty low because everyone was very disappointed and obviously um, last year uh, June when there were presidential elections and also previous um, parliamentary elections the same year uh, they were one of the lowest, if not the lowest, uh, they had one of the lowest, if not the lowest turnout in uh, Iranian modern history or the history of the Islamic Republic. So that's also important that those institutions that have very little legitimacy, if you look at it that way. And actually, one follow up question would be, what's the level of, you know, of course, there is no separation between, you know, religion and politics mm -hmm. but you know we mentioned all of these different um parts of, of government you know the president the parliament the council the supreme leader how does religion what does religion what role does religion play in these different roles sorry that, that well i would say when it comes to the government and to the system i would say religion is the place the us central role as you can imagine um for example iranian law uh, after 1979 uh, it's a sharia law so sharia based law with certain elements of a civil law but when it comes to things like criminal code uh civil code parts of the civil code for example uh, marriage uh, families things like that that's mostly sharia based uh when it comes to certain uh, financial aspects. Uh, Iran, for example, is using the Islamic law uh, in banking. They're using Islamic finance and things like that. So I would say religion is central to the system, central to the Iranian legal system, um, and of course to the state institutions. Uh, secular parties as such, they cannot exist within the current framework and they also wouldn't be allowed to exist within the current framework of course and and just for every you know to remind everyone iran is a shia muslim country and i would say probably the, the, more than 90 percent of the population is shia muslim yeah iran has a majority of them are shia muslims it has a small um, sunni minority in the south and southeast so uh small arab minority which live in the province of khuzestan and also a small uh, baluch minority which baluch people they also live partially in pakistan afghanistan and uh, southeastern iran they they are differently different ethnically different they have uh, they are sunnis and they speak a different language as well but that's minority majority it's a shia state and iran has been very very um um i would say careful about guarding its shia identity uh it's not that easy to build a sunni mosque if not impossible except for the majority 
areas where you have Arabs or Baluch people living, you cannot just randomly build a Sunni mosque in Tehran. You're not going to get permission to do that. Um, and also uh, people, for example, converting, if you like to, if, if you can use that word, converting from Shia to Sunni would not be seen well. Um, Iran sort of sees itself as the carrier of the Shia, true as they think Islam, um, across the Middle East, also in the world. And as much as, for example, Saudi Arabia has been very um, active at building uh, Islamic centers, at, uh, at building mosques across the world, Iran has been doing the same. So you can see um, Iranian mosques everywhere in Europe, in the Middle East. You can see them, I don't know, in Germany. You can even see them in Georgia and Tbilisi. Uh, they've been very, very, uh, like their religious diplomacy is very aggressive in that respect. Right. And you did mention actually something, since you mentioned that the uh, these minorities are in, in different parts of the country, it's also worth remembering that Iran, although it's quite religiously religiously homogeneous, it's quite, it's more diverse than one would imagine in terms of ethnicity, like it, it's not um, as um, mm -hmm. demographically and ethnically um, monolithic as, as some as, as, as an outsider would think? Yeah, absolutely. Iran has uh, only, I would say, I think 60% of ethnic Persians. So the rest, of course, Persians who are Iranian citizens, but you have Iranian citizens who are, for example, Kurdish, who live in the West, uh, uh, in the province of Kurdistan and partially in the uh, province of Azerbaijan. Uh, you also have, um, I would say, Turkish minority is one of the biggest minority. They live in the um, north of Iran. Uh, yes, and then you have, as I mentioned, Baluch people. You have Arabs, a small percentage of Arabs in the south. Um, and you also have smaller Iranian speaking, like uh, Lors, for example. They also live in the um, west. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty diverse when it comes to the ethnic um, background. Um, of course, uh, Iran has been pretty, I would say their national identity as feeling Iranian, as them think, feeling Iranian has been pretty, pretty strong. So I wouldn't say Iran has any sort of a, a strong separatist movement or anything like that. Uh, but nevertheless, yeah, it's very interesting how it's diverse ethnically. Yeah, there's definitely something that that um, I'm sure a lot of listeners wouldn't be familiar with. Uh, and, you know, it, it helps painting, you know, the picture of, of what's happening uh, because we're also speaking about, about yeah. like a incredibly um, mm -hmm. large country. Uh, I mean, it's not just 85 million people, but it's as large as probably Germany, France, Italy, yeah. Spain, and the UK combined. So it, it, it's it's a massive country um, with, 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 with a very diverse population and, and geography. Yeah. It's also a bit of a different uh, perspective how, for example, people in the West who say a Kurdish woman has been killed, and it sort of implies um, as in she's Kurdish and that's the and that has any meaning except for her being from Kurdistan. However, in Iran, is it's a very common thing to mention where you come from. It's the same as if you come from Italy, you can say I'm from Rome or I'm from Milan or anything like that. So they say I'm Kurdish or I'm half, uh, I don't know, I'm half Azeri. And that just doesn't imply that they are feeling differently and they don't feel Iranian, it's just more of a first place or just to indicate where their parents are from. Like we say, I'm from that city or from that city. So uh, I just wanted to mention that. Too. No, that's very interesting. That, that's, that's really very interesting. Um, so, okay, I think we, we, we managed to kind of build a bit of a, of a, a sense of, of, of Iran in general. Um, so I think we can kind of move on to you know, to the most recent event. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And everything that happened starting from, well, the 13th and then the 16th of, yeah. of uh, September when Max Zalini was arrested and then um, admitted into hospital unconscious mm -hmm. and died uh, shortly after, uh, which was kind of the spark of the protest that we've been yeah. seeing for weeks now. Um, can you help us understand what what happened there? Because of course it will, you know, it does require a bit of an understanding of what some laws are in Iran regarding mm -hmm. women's rights and so on. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess I have to start by saying that Iran at the moment, uh, except from Afghanistan since last year, uh, but otherwise Iran is the only state in the world where uh, women have to wear a headscarf, which is called Ruseri, or they have to, and they have to wear a coat, which have to has to technically cover your bottom, so probably reach your knees, and uh, which is called mantu. And by law, you're supposed to wear it everywhere in public places, including your own car. So, for example, you cannot drive your own car without wearing a headscarf, even though it's your car. Uh, everywhere you go, doctors' offices, uh, schools, uh, banks, uh, even on the street, you're supposed to wear that. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a foreigner, uh, if you're a Christian, or if you're a Zoroastrian, which I'll uh, have to remind that Iran still has a, a small percentage of Christians, which are mostly Armenians, uh, Armen Iranian Armenian. Uh, they have a small percentage of Jews and a small percentage of uh, Zoroastrians. So those people also have to cover up and follow exactly the same rules that the Muslim Iranians have to follow. Um, it also includes foreign diplomats. So by law, uh, foreign diplomats, women, they also have to cover up. Uh, I guess the natural question would be what would happen if you don't cover up? Now, this is a very, very vague territory. So very, of course, it also changed over the past 45, 43 years uh, since the revolution happened. Uh, at the beginning, uh, it wasn't exactly, you know, that the revolution happened officially on the 11th of February, 1979. And on 12th of February, everyone had to go out only wearing a scarf. It was very gradually, and there were, of course, protests actually uh, 43 years ago, because first the government introduced the, the, the scarves in the public, uh, uh, in the government offices. So for example, any public institutions, you could walk on the street normally, and then you would have to kind of cover up in the government institution. Then it was uh, moved into the employees who had to wear it, and then gradually everyone had to do it. And 43 years ago, it was much stricter. So if you were walking on the street and your headscarf slipped, probably you would get the policeman coming out of God knows from where and telling you to put it back on. Uh, it happens today as well. However, uh, you know, in parks, um, I would say by the sea, if you go north or south by the sea, if there is no actually police patrol around, nobody's going to tell you anything. Uh, but again, that's a very vague territory because you can get away with it or you can actually be beaten to death. So that's where uh, you are trying your luck. And unfortunately, uh, what happened on the 13th of uh, September uh, you've seen the picture of this girl, uh, you know, she was wearing a coat, she was wearing a scarf, but sometimes the police, and it's a very common thing in Iran, they pick up one person and they make an example of her or him. That's a very common uh, tool that regime is using. So they um, pick up one random innocent person, they either torture them to death, they kill them, or, you know, they make their life really miserable. And then everyone is scared because this person is innocent and everyone knows that they're innocent. And at the same time, they think it could have been me. And that's where the fear starts. So that's, a, that's I would say, Iran's regime favorite tool. Uh, now, what would happen if, for example, you've, you are stopped by the police? Usually, they would just say, I mean, 
they of course depends on their mood. On as a woman, you're saying, obviously. Yeah, as a woman. Yeah. So p police patrols, uh, they are driving, they're part of the uh, police. They're not specifically moral police, as it's said, as it's said on the, in the West. It's a police that has to guard the public order. So, for example, if somebody is robbing a bank, there would be the same branch of police dealing with them. Now, there's usually a man and a woman or two men and two women in the car. So if a woman is detained, she's detained by the female officers. Uh, the, the female officers, they have the, their own uniform. They're wearing the black chador, which is a fully full black cloak, uh, you know, from head to toe. Um, <clears throat> so usually if the police officers are in a good mood, they would tell you to put the scarf back on and uh, just tell you not to do it again. And you're expected to apologize, cover up properly, you know, like if any hair is show, shown and then just walk away. However, if they're in a bad mood, they can also detain you. They can bring you to a station. Uh, you would have to sign papers. If you are a married or um, young woman, your father or your husband may need to come and pick you up. Uh, it also depends on your status. Um, uh, they will check your IDs and everything, or they can let you go just after you apologizing. If you are detained, again, you're at the mercy of the officers. They can just lecture you and let you go, but just keep your name as, a, as an offender. And then if you're a repeated offender, then yeah, you can get into troubles. But you know, if they are brutal, you can be beaten to death. So that's a very um, vague territory. Um, so what we've seen is that unfortunately, Mahsa, she was uh, detained by those who wanted to make an example, example of her. And uh, hijab has been on the, you know, it was, it was spoken about in Iran over the past, uh, I would say, five years. And there were many calls of uh, conservatives who would say, oh, uh, women stopped covering up properly. We have to introduce stricter laws. We have to punish those who do not obey. And the more they were saying that, of course, the society just resists. Um, yeah. So these these are the laws and the framework uh, right. that everyone have, has to follow in Iran. So so she was she was stopped allegedly for for breaking one of these um, uh, laws and codes about. Um... Yeah, yeah, you can you can yeah. She was stopped for that. It's very hard to say exactly what triggered their attention. I mean, a little bit of your hair may be showing. They can say, oh we don't like it, or your sleeve might be too short, or anything like that. Or you might be wearing jewelry in the past, there was also, but doesn't happen anymore. But in the 80s, it was very common to stop women who had their nails polished. And that was an offense as well. Now they stop doing that because everyone has it. So, yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I guess before we, we, we move on, I, I would I would ask you if, if, if you could, if you want, um, can you give us like, a few other examples of um, similar laws that affect women's life in Iran. I mean, we, 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 I'm, I'm sure we could spend hours only speaking of that, but if you could just go through like, a, you know, a list of things that come to mind, just, just to give, you know, people mm -hmm. listening an idea of what it is uh, to yeah. be a woman in Iran. Well, I guess the main, um, main laws that affect the women's life are uh, of course family life and the the laws that, that, that govern the fa family life and um, because of that the property and how she can be a member of society so uh, for example uh, as a woman to be uh, to have your first iranian passport issued you would need the permission of your father usually or if you never had it and you're already married, then you would need the permission of your husband. You don't need your husband's permission every time you leave the country. So once he gives the permission for a passport, that's, that implies that he's happy for you to travel. Uh, however, if your father or if your husband, they're not happy for you to travel, uh, they can issue the so-called prohibition of exit and uh, you won't be able to leave the country. 
uh, they can do it. They don't need a reason to do that. They can just say that it doesn't, your travels do not go well with your family life. And that's given. Uh, now, every woman in Iran also has, legally has a guardian, which is, mah, which is called Mahram. So a guardian is supposed to give you <laughs> permissions for certain uh, roles in society. For example, if you would like to work, you would need your guardian, guardian's permission. And um, at any time, uh, for example, you've been working for five years and then your husband says, yeah, you know what? I don't want you to work. I want you to stay at home. Uh, he has the right to uh, just uh, take his permission away or prohibit you to do that, if you like to call it that way. And you won't be able to work. Uh, the same goes for studies uh, in the university. Um, there are a few examples, for example, of uh, Iranian uh, sport women who were in sports and they were supposed to go to an international competition, but they were going through a rough time, family time with their husbands. So just out of spite, there are a few cases when the husband would prohibit them from going abroad and, of course, ruining their career. Um, that um, also when it comes to the custody of children, uh, children in Islam and Sharia law, they belong to their husband's family. So when mother and father divorce, then after the age of seven, uh, children can stay with father. They, sh they should stay with father unless father doesn't want it. And usually fathers, they take them away. And uh, after the age of seven, the women don't have any rights to those children. So they may not see their mothers ever, if the father says so. Um, so these are one of the most, uh, I would say, brutal laws. Um, there are also, I guess, for, for compared to those, they're, they're slightly less, uh, in, they have less impact. But again, if we compare it to the freedom women have in the West, uh, you, as an unmarried woman, you won't be able to rent an apartment, for example. No. Uh, as an unmarried woman, you it's almost impossible. I mean, if there are two unmarried women, for example, traveling, they're going to get, they, they're able to get a room in the hotel. Uh, but if you're alone, unmarried, uh, and you, for example, want to travel from, I don't know, Shiraz to, say, uh, the island of Kish, just to have a week of, you know, week off, and you want to book a room in the hotel, you won't be able to do that. Mm. What about owning property? Yeah, women can own a property, of course. Uh, you can own a property, and usually uh, uh, they try to get a property from their fathers or like families uh, before the marriage. Uh, or in Iran, there's a thing called um, basically when you get married, you sign. A marriage contract where husband has to pay you something either money or gold or properties or anything valuable which is going to be yours in case of divorce so women try to get as much as they can in that period because uh, it's going to be very difficult to do that during the marriage uh, but yes they can of course they can own a property they can uh, there used to be those rumors that they can't drive but that's not true I would say half, if not more, uh, drivers in Tehran are women, and uh, because Tehran is has a very, very poor uh, public transport system. The everyone traffic goes. in Tehran, I hear it's the worst. Yeah. So yeah, everyone, women, old, young, you see so many grandmas uh, driving a car because just otherwise it's impossible to get around. So yeah. That's in that regard, oh yeah, and of course, the one of the most famous one, um, uh, you cannot go and watch, for example, football game. You are not allowed into the stadium, that too. And there was a huge dispute between, um, you know, opposition figures outside of Iran who was trying to pressurize the uh, FIFA, telling them, please expel Iran or like restrict their uh, participation in any event because this is what they're doing to their women. Right. Would that apply to any kind of public events? Uh, well, 
I mean, if, I know it's if, growth. If the, men, if the men are participating there, yes. Yes. Right. So oh. there is an element of segregation in, in society. Yeah. I, I guess one more thing, which is worth mentioning, uh, women are not to allowed to uh, perform music, sing, uh, sorry, actually uh, sing in solo. So if there is a choir or like anything traditional, and there are many of them, you can do that. And especially if they're in the background and the male is leading. Uh, but if it's a solo female singer, uh, it's also prohibited. So you can't do that either. Right. I mean, this is, you know, uh, uh, it's really helpful. Um, I know a lot of these things, you know, to you, to you will be almost, you know, obvious things, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure uh, I myself and people who will be listening to us are not necessarily familiar with this and it, and it helps to paint, you know, the picture. Um, but going back to September, so Mazar Mini was, was stopped and because of of, 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 you know, a decision of the police to target her or something like mm -hmm. that. And she was beaten up and admitted into hospital where she died. And this triggered a, uh, a wave of, of protests. Yeah. Um, although, and tell me if I'm wrong, the protest started in her hometown. Is that right? Yeah. So there are there are people who started gathering next to her uh, hospital, which was uh, Kasra Hospital in Tehran, when she was still alive. But there were very few people, and they were not like full protest, but just you know people kind of trying to show support. But the the main thing started uh, from her funeral, which uh, the government tried to pressurize her family to hold the funeral in secret. Uh, in order to avoid people joining in. Uh, but then, yeah, her home family, which is Sakes, uh, it's a city in the Kurdistan province. Uh, that's that's like north, where the whole thing, um, sorry? That's like northwest or something like that. I was yeah, yeah, it's northwest. It's a province of Kurdistan. And that's basically where it all started. And uh, people who came to her funeral while well, actually knowing that they're coming for a protest already. Uh, so it wasn't anything, you know, accidental or anything that, you know, just happened there. It was, um, uh, I would say they already knew that they're going to protest. There was women who already took off their hijabs there and they burned them and they started chanting all those anti-government slogans and then everyone picked it up uh, within 24 hours in many most of the cities in Iran. I guess um, <clears throat> uh, Sistan of Balochistan was, uh, which is the uh, south uh, east, they, they were probably one of the last to join, but especially north, uh, north, west, Tehran, um, Mashhad also, which is one of the biggest cities in Iran, uh, they they started uh, protesting almost immediately as well. And that actually brings me to another question because it was it was the first thing I was wondering. I mean, um, she was stopped and arrested and mm -hmm. killed in Tehran, and then she was moved to a funeral was in her mm -hmm. hometown, Sakes. Um, but you mentioned that there were people outside of the hospital where she was mm -hmm. kept. So how did the news travel? How, how did everyone suddenly <laughs> become aware that that of what happened to her? And also, you know, this protest started in a relatively small city in the north um, west of, of, mm -hmm. of Iran. How did that spread so rapidly and, and to such a degree and extent across the country? Uh, well, uh, there was, um, I guess there was a coincidence or maybe uh, uh, rumors and rumors of this spread. So at the hospital, there was a um, journalist, a photojournalist of the uh, one of the biggest, I would say, relatively reformist uh, newspapers in Iran, which is called Shark, uh, which is um, East. And 
the photojournalist from that newspaper, she happened to be at the hospital and she actually took uh, pictures which everyone saw were uh, Mahsa Amini, she was already in the hospital bed with, you know, uh, bleeding from coming out of her ear with um, massive injuries, multiple injuries. And she actually took those pictures and those pictures were published and they were immediately on Instagram on Telegram on Twitter. And this spread within a few hours. And by then, uh, uh, internet was still working in Iran. I mean, it still works, but it's extremely ex restricted right now. And uh, it just started spreading. And uh, I guess I also have to mention here that over the past um, uh, three years, I would say, uh, the, the moods and the attitudes of the people in Iran, they have, the moods are and the the environment is extremely extremely tense so everyone was kind of waiting for a sparkle i guess subconsciously and the sparkle happened and um it just this is how it started spreading uh people were extremely unhappy uh you know um the, the economy the, the economic situation in iran has been pretty bad uh uh, of course, as you know, Iran is under sanctions, and uh, since 2018, uh, the sanctions were actually um, increased. So economic situation has been really bad. Uh, then Corona happened, and then there was a number of incidents uh, which sparked the protest itself, which you probably know about the 2019 the protest in 2019. Then there was another protest in 2020 when the Ukrainian plane was shut down. Uh, there was extreme, extreme um, dissatisfaction of uh, people, you know, with the way the government handled the corona crisis in Iran. Uh, Iran had an extremely high death rate at the beginning. Uh, Iran actually insisting, insisted on not importing the vaccine. So obviously all those factors, they caused a lot of frustration and something like this uh, a death of a woman who was bitten by the government uh agents uh to death for something you know for the cr crime if you call this a crime that could happen to anyone this would there was the spark that uh you know it yeah. would just make it spread really so, quick it, but it, it still sounds that you know like despite you know iran being an incredibly repressive and authoritarian um regime and country mm -hmm. um you know this was possible because of some relative you know th there is an extent to which news can be shared and published i mean would you say that that's the case i would say um it is despite that because uh, out of all the social media that we know of, the only one which until recently was not restricted was Instagram. But Iranians learned to live with the VPNs on their phones, on their laptops, and they never have their phone without a VPN. Mm -hmm. And um, so they they learn to live with the most young people, I would imagine. Yes, the young one, of course. Um, but I mean, mobile internet and also the internet uh, as a you know, landline and Wi-Fi, they're also really widespread. And uh, even in the poor villages, the person may not own, um, let's say, um, a sofa, but they're going to have a proper internet. So Iran is really well connected in that regard. Uh, Yes, social media are also extremely popular. Instagram is probably the most popular social media right. platform in Iran. Uh, so it's ideal yeah. to share images that then travel very quickly, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah. yeah, they travel really quickly and uh, it just would not be feasible to... Iran doesn't have at the moment the, the resources to shut down eight, eight, uh, 80 million people uh, from sharing it. And it shares really quickly. Okay. Um, thank you. And so let you know, so the, the protests 
begin. Uh, they begin from the funeral and then they gradually spread to the bigger cities across mm -hmm. the country. They reach the opposite side of the country. Mm -hmm. even. Um, these are all kind of leaderless protests, like it, it's they're kind of spontaneous yeah. protests of, of, of people who are just fed up with, with you know, of course, with, with angry about what happened, mm -hmm. but also fed up with the current situation of Iran, mm -hmm. not only because of the absurd laws and, and, and the living conditions of women, but also, you know, because of, as you said, the way coronavirus was handled, the economy that's been stagnating for years and so on. Um, I guess it's hard because of that. It's kind of hard for a for an outsider to kind of make sense of who are the parties involved in this in in this struggle that is going on. Of course, you have protesters, but you know um, who are they? You know, quite simply, and also what are they up against? You know, it's the police, mm -hmm. but then, you know, you, there are different. Um, I think we meant we we talked about this once. You know, there are different. Um, corps within the police and the army, mm -hmm. and they have different powers and uh, different privileges. Um, yeah. Can you help us understand that a bit? Yeah, well, um, it's actually a very good question. And I guess uh, if we were fully able to answer this question, that would we would have an answer on how those protests, uh, whether they're going to succeed or fail again. Um, I guess I would start by saying that at the moment, there are no leaders uh, of those protests, which is good and bad at the same time. So the way, uh, the way, why is it good? Well, you know, it's it was started by the people. So the main driver of this were people. And, uh, you know, if, if it was started by a certain political group, eliminating this group would probably uh, downplay and repress the protests and it would just uh, go away within two, three weeks. At the same time, because they're, um, they don't have a leadership that can also uh, lead to, um, you know, they may just dissolve within two, three weeks, which is also a big danger. Um, as opposed to, let's say, protests in 2019, which were three years ago, uh, the good thing about this is that a lot of uh, public figures, not at, the, not at the beginning, but gradually they started coming out with support of the protests. So a lot of um, actors, actresses, uh, sportsmen, uh, they came out in support of those protests. Uh, of course, nobody from the political scene would do that because that would technically could cost them a life. Uh, but uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, public figures uh, who came out in support. Unfortunately, nobody yet could be judged as a leader or a group of leaders of those protests. Um, uh, so, yeah. so it's mostly so, and and in terms of of uh, participation, I mean, you know, yeah. Well, would, in you, terms would of, you say that there is like a demographic, or there are any anything that you think is stands out, or is it quite? Um, I guess one of the very important point to make here in terms of participation is that it's probably the first time uh, since 1979 where all of the uh, groups of the society, they participated. Uh, all of the ethnic religious groups, they also participated. Uh, there hasn't been a single group who stayed away or let's say they tried to disengage from this. So let's compare this to um, 2019 where I would say most of the middle class, upper middle class and of course the upper class, they just try to ignore it and just wait for it to die down. Uh, right now, you can see people from very poor backgrounds and from, you know, uh, people who own properties abroad and they have other citizenship or they could freely go abroad and live a comfortable life abroad. They choose to stay. Uh, there are cases of people who lived abroad and they choose to come back to Iran right. just to participate. Uh, you have a people who can live a very comfortable life in Iran right now under the current regime as well, 
and they also uh, participate. Uh, and of course, you get the, uh, a lot of uh, government employees, you know, like I would say lower employees in administration, uh, teachers, uh, uh, doctors as well. So you can see them participating. I don't think there has been a single group in Iranian society that hasn't joined in, which is a very, very good um, factor. And that's a good sign as well. And it's also quite widespread across the country. It's not localized in one city or in one area. Yes, area. exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, up until now, there was around 90 cities across Iran where you had active protests going on. Uh, but of course you have in smaller villages there are much more which probably is difficult to count they might not go all, all the time um i would also say the good thing about these ones are the strategy uh because what we see right now compared to the previous protests is that people because of not having a leadership people try to organize themselves so they try to um, for example, keep the main streets, stay on the uh, stay on the main squares. Uh, they also don't just stand there and chant. Uh, they also try to attack police. They they there were cases of, for example, several uh, uh, police stations that have been burned in Tehran or like other cities as well. Uh, there were police cars that were burnt. Uh, and until now, it's very difficult to tell, for example, the number of uh, casualties among the policemen. But based on um, reports which are uh, presented by different uh, human rights organizations uh, and by independent journalists in Iran, there can be like several hundred of uh, police officers that have been injured to a certain degree. There is also a number of uh, killed police officers uh there have also been reports which unfortunately they can't be uh confirmed independently but there are reports of uh uh protesters being able to get hold of the weapons and uh protecting themselves that way so we should mention of course that uh when we say protecting themselves i mean 150 i think the latest figure that i saw was 154 protests have been killed yeah um, beaten up shot yeah you know, more than 800 almost 900 have been injured and mm. thousands have been arrested and probably these are conservative estimates yeah uh, i mean you can see uh even by by from the injuries or the way those people were killed that uh, <clears throat> a lot of them were shot in the face by the special forces shot in the face, shot in the chest. So obviously the special forces specifically aimed to kill them. Yeah, and at close course, range. Either. Yeah, close range and to make an example of them, hoping that the rest are going to fear and just, uh, you know, don't come out of the houses tomorrow. And when you when you say, you know, you meant, we, meant, we said the police, we said the special forces, can, can you help us understand mm -hmm. like like who they are, like what, what mm -hmm. are the different groups and different... Um, yeah corps that are involved in this yeah so um at the moment we iran i would say iranian armed forces uh there are two branches of it so there is a regular army which is uh have they, they have higher numbers the regular army that's called artesh and they have around um 400 400 500 thousand personnel uh they usually don't take any their role is to protect iranian borders in terms of in case of a foreign invasion in terms of in case of a very i don't know uh it's random, a regular army basically yeah it's a regular yeah. army now iran also has a what's called uh revolutionary guards right the yeah. revolutionary guards they they're a semi-political, semi-military organization that has been created uh, after the revolution. And their role is uh, intelligence, military intelligence. They're also 
uh, have to lead the so-called uh, export of revolution abroad. So you you know you can see their activities in Lebanon, in Yemen, uh, all over the Middle East. So that's their main role, and their they they their personnel is probably twice as less as the regular army, but uh, they have much more influence and power in Iran. So they're not only purely military or politically military organization. They also own a lot of enterprises. Uh, most of the state and let's say Iran's um, most of the enterprises uh, that are related to uh, key industries such as for example oil they're all state and by state I mean they're most of them are controlled by the revolutionary guards so that's a huge huge power uh, they have so in terms of politics in terms of military personnel and of course in terms of economy they're extremely powerful. I, I, I would say for the, because a lot of people listen to us are, are in Italy. In Italy, they're probably more known as Pazdaran. Is that, is that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Pazda, Pazdaran is uh, our guards in Farsi. Right. So, uh, yes, Sepahe Pazdaran is the short name uh, for them. Uh, but yeah, Pazdaran is extremely um, powerful and they they would be the government's main pillar of power in term in case of the turmoil. Now, when you say the government, you mean the the, the, the president system. and the supreme leader and and the council, right? Um, I guess yeah, that's a good question. I guess when I say government, I mean the system, the institutions, the institutions, which is a, a supreme leader, uh, councils, uh, you know, guardian council. And of course, president and um, parliament as well, but because they have so little power, I wouldn't really separate them from the whole system. Um, so for the sake of um, saving the regime, the, the Pazderan would be the main pillar of their support. However, when it comes to Artesh, uh, which is the regular army, there have been a lot of speculation, especially over the past few years, and that came public this, uh, during those protests as well. Um, Artesh is very, very divided. I mean, the, I'll, I'll get to that later. Pazderan itself is very divided as well. Uh, but Artesh and the regular army is kind of a weak uh, spot of the regime. So right now, uh, there were a lot of speculation that part of the regular army were considering, uh, if not supporting the protesters, they're at least not engaging at suppressing it. And there were cases uh, three years ago when certain, some officers of the regular army, they refused to shoot, for example. There were cases like that. Um, <clears throat> so, that's what I mean by uh, special forces. At the moment, uh, everyone who's dealing with the protesters, you know, shoots them and uh, arrests them. These are parts of the Revolutionary Guards. Right. So, so they are on. So there's, there's the regular police, and then there's the Revolutionary Guard who gets really involved in the cracking down of the yeah. protests, right? Yeah. And just for us also to understand, um, the the army answers to like the. the <laughs> Commander in chief of the army is the supreme leader, right? Yes, exactly. And, uh, and yeah. Uh, so yes, he's both uh, responsible for, and they are they're reporting directly to him. Uh, right, both... and the same the the revolutionary guards. Yes. Right, um, but as you mentioned, there are there are questions regarding the loyalty of the mm -hmm. army, or of at least of parts of the army. But you were also mentioning that there are divisions among the Revolutionary Guards. Can you help yes. us understand that? Um, well, I guess uh, over the past, uh, Revolutionary Guards were a much more united institution right after the revolution. Uh, eventually, as years passed, uh, certain divisions or like certain parts of the Revolutionary Guards, they would be they would get more economically involved in certain uh, industries, you know, in that 
because of that they they would get more profit out of it they would be able to say they would take more shares than others and of course that created uh, divisions within the the organization uh they're also more conservative like uh more conservative uh, parts of the revolution guards which is uh for example the quds regiment which was uh, headed before by uh soleimani who was killed in iraq uh, two years ago, they were uh, one of the most conservative uh, parts of it, uh, of, the, of the Revolutionary Guards. They were extremely aggressive when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, and, you know, you could see the Iran's activities in, in Yemen or in Lebanon. They were specifically, uh, you know, designated and uh, orchestrated by that part of the Revolutionary Guards. Uh, when it came to internal issues, they were also very, very um, uh, conservative, as in they excluded any, um, you know, uh, conversation with the people, trying to solve the dispute, trying to understand what's wrong. They were come out shoot everyone and go home so that was their strategy they were extremely extremely aggressive now there are different divisions of revolutionary guards uh they're not as as um, i would say united as they want to seem and uh, of course you can see that there is a lot of uh, loopholes um, for example you can see that here and then there in iran there's all all those unexplained explosions at the governmental sites which were extremely common over the past two three years which a lot of people contribute to uh, loopholes in the intelligence and security uh, in uh, security of uh, uh, Pazdran's intelligence uh, you can see that there were here and then there were uh, scientists killed especially everyone who was related to a nuclear security or nuclear program iran's nuclear program um so yeah but in the sense when you say holes in, in in security and intelligence you mean in the sense that they were like that there was no knowledge of what um there was no knowledge of what um of some of some foreign actor acting inside Iran, or are you talking about internal sabotage? Uh, Both. There were there were a lot of talks about the internal sabotage within the Pazdaran itself, because there are elements of the Revolution Guards who are not happy, for example, with the way uh, Iran is right now as well. Uh, a lot of revolutionary guards they hope that after the sanctions were briefly lifted that they're going to reap all the benefits you know take all they could from the oil industry foreign investment and um, that didn't happen so there the monopoly for the part of the revolutionary guards it stayed but the rest who hoped to get rich based on the nuclear deal they got nothing and obviously they're not happy with that and uh, yeah, those divisions are also extremely dangerous um, uh, for the regime. And coming back to the protesters, because um, I think this gave us a bit of a sense of, of, of where, you know, who the, of what's on the other side, but um, coming back to the protesters, um, what are the protesters' um, requests, really? Like, what, what, are, what are they asking? Uh, that's also a very good question, and uh, I would say there are two issues with it. First of all, it's probably the first time in the history of uh, Iran over the past 43 years where all the slogans immediately were political. So there were no economic grievances at first, they were political right away, and the slogans were, we don't want Islamic Republic. So I guess that kind of mirrors the attitudes of, I would say, majority. By now, I'm sure you can say a majority of Iranians who know really well that they don't want Islamic Republic anymore. They don't want it to be reformed, reformist, uh, as it was um, 
uh, in 2009, if you remember green movement and yeah. first major protests in Iran, those were not so explicitly anti-system. So those were more, we want to be free within the system. The current protests are purely anti-system. So they don't want Islamic Republic. They don't want Islamic, uh, the, the uh, Supreme leader and they don't want uh, current uh, regime and current laws. The bad part of the story is that unfortunately people have not yet formed what they actually want instead. I guess over the past, uh, it's been how long? Three and a half uh, weeks. Um, there is all this frustration and rage and uh, anger that accumulated over decades of um, the, you know, the, the Islamic Republic uh, that was in power and they were just uh, pouring out their anger, their frustration and they, their determination to stop this. At the same time, um, we haven't heard among the protesters, among the public figures, uh, we haven't heard how do they see post-Islamic Republic Iran and that's actually one of the biggest problems I would say of those protesters, protests, because in order for it to become a revolution, uh, they have to form a vision of what they fight for. Because after two, three weeks, people may get tired, people get shot on the street, and it's not enough for them to know that they are dying just for the sake of Re Islamic Republic to go. They also need to know eventually what they die for. And uh, yeah, this vision has to be formed. Uh, it hasn't been formed yet, unfortunately. And uh, I guess we'll see in the next few weeks what's going to happen. I guess nobody is yet ready to... Yeah, a lot of people say, yeah, we don't want this system. We want a secular or we want a semi-secular state. Uh, but I guess nobody is... I don't know, brave or everyone got used to the system so much that it just sounds weird to them to even say that. So, I mean, it, it also needs to be said that, you know, the current system is being in place for now, you know, since 1979, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. like, you know, a lot of the people who are protesting in the streets have never known anything else. Yes, yeah, that's true as well. That's true. And, um, uh, they know this system, their parents know the kingdom, uh, which was the Shah. And as weird as it may sound, not everyone would want to come back to the system that happened, that, that, that ended in 1979. So if people were told, we want, you, you can bring the Shah back, I don't think that it would be a black and white decision and not everyone would agree. Um, so basically it's it's about, you know, it's not about going back mm -hmm. to something that existed in, in mm -hmm. some past. It's about building something. Something new. Around. And this is, yes. And new. this is one of the probably biggest problems because it's very, okay, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it very easy because the system is extremely brutal and to bring it down, it's going to cost a lot of lives, but it's still possible to bring it down. Now, building something instead of it, something that, 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 that's going to be better than anything Iran had before, this is going to be the major step and the biggest uh, challenge. And it's particularly hard, of course, because there aren't many, I would, I would imagine, it, you know, one also needs examples from from you know from other countries with a similar history and mm -hmm. and you know who maybe made that transition and there aren't many good examples of that probably <clears throat> so that yeah i mean yeah i mean a lot of iranians they they uh, try to give it turkey as an example yeah um to say look this country had been an ottoman empire where the ottoman sultan was actually a a religious authority of all the muslims and look they uh transformed transformed into a republic and a secular republic. At the same time, um, a lot of people forget that Turkey went through a good 30 years, 40 years of a, a very, you know, let's say one man rule um, 
power and uh, it wasn't so easy. And I guess mentally not everyone right now in Iran understands that to be able to bring the system down and change it, that's going to require probably one generation in order for this to work. So that's not going to be five years. It's not going to be 10 years. It would probably be good 20 years in order for it to work properly instead of coming back to where it started. Exactly. And and also, you know, because of course you mentioned you mentioned Turkey, which you know, there are also many reasons why, you know, if you know looking at Turkey is not necessarily like a, you know, um always yeah. a good example, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but also the other thing, you know, maybe that's a good analogy, is that uh Iran also has a very ancient tradition and culture and you know and 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 Iranians are on average I would assume quite you know quite proud of that mm -hmm. and it, it's very difficult to try and you know and and you know to even think about building a new um a new system within within such an ancient civilization that has such a that has such a strong cultural um yeah element yeah i mean iranians are extremely uh when it comes to a state tradition and uh, they're extremely proud of it and uh despite the islamic that, let's not let's not be dismissive like you know iranian culture you know there, there are great things about iranian culture and persian absolutely culture. Yeah, yeah. Rich, obviously I, I hope i didn't sound dismissive um, uh, no, no, no. Uh, yes, they're extremely uh, happy, uh, proud of their culture, and uh, you know they have one of the longest, probably, um, state uh, traditions uh, in the world. Um, and this is why so many people feel like past forty years were just a, I, I don't know, unexplainable error in the long course of history. Um, and you, uh, for example, we also have to understand that even people who are, let's say, pro-regime or they're part of the regime, uh, they also they never uh, they never deny their their connection to Iranian heritage because they know that they're legitimate. They won't have any legitimacy if they deny their connection to Iranian past history. So. I mean, one of those elements you can say is that no rules, which is the Zoroastrian New Year, and it's also Iranian national holiday. It's a state holiday. It's celebrated uh, by everyone, even by very religious Muslims. Uh, and the government never dared, never ever dared to touch this holiday because uh, there are certain elements in the culture that uh, they're untouchable. Yeah, and you know, it, this of course has to be said in the context of, of the fact that, of course, you know, Iran is is today a a um, like a religious um, theocracy, an Islamic theocracy. Um, but of course, its cultural roots are you know much more ancient than Islam, mm -hmm. you know, by thousands of years. So. Mm -hmm. You know, we we you know when, what I think you you reference there is the fact that there is a cultural tradition that precedes, um, yeah, um, and that is still present within society, and people are quite attached to it and hold yeah. on to it. Yeah, I also think we have to remember that yes, Iran is viewed as a very religious country because of the government and because of uh, how the system is set up. It. Sometimes it's perceived as an extremely religious, uh, intolerant society. But truth be told, uh, Iranians uh, are probably one of the least religious uh, people in the Middle East. I know sometimes it might sound like a, a you know, a, a mistake. But yes, they're one of the, the, the they're one of the least religious uh, people in the Middle East, and the amount of atheists. In Iran is probably the highest in the Middle East and partially it's because of the policies of the Islamic Republic because you know as you can imagine everything that's pushed yeah. on you so hard it just people just resist and uh, um, 
yeah so this is something that also has to has to be taken into account when uh, we talk about Iran. Um, so the, the the protests have now been going on for what is it um, uh, almost thirty days now, a bit less maybe. And um, what would you say? You know, looking forward uh, to to what's going to happen in 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 the next days, weeks, months. What do you think are the trends we should look at? Like, what should we pay attention to? What, you know, it's very easy from, from the outside to pay attention to the wrong things. And, you know, we, we can see that not only in Iran, but with mm -hmm. other international situations, very often um, those who are on the outside and maybe have a, a very basic understanding will look at things thinking they're important because they would be important in their cultural mm -hmm context but they're not really that relevant so what would you say there are the other things we should look out for the things that matter and and on the other hand you know misconceptions or things that we shouldn't really pay too much attention to mm -hmm. well um i guess we shouldn't be really uh upset about the fact that sometimes the protests die down yes they do die down especially right now there are holidays in iran religious holidays, so people have a day off, and also they probably need to regroup. So I don't think we should still take it as a sign of uh, protest go protests going away. Uh, I think what we should look at is at the social groups that are still participating. So there were news of um, oil industry workers uh, striking. There's a lot of strikes uh, among students as well and the professors uh, and that's really important so if that one goes on uh, this is what we should look at um, also I think we should pay attention to any public figures or any anyone who can be a leader or lead this somehow or at least guide it somewhere to certain direction. We also have to look out for that. Um, and I guess uh, we just have to wait and see. I mean, um, regardless of how those protests are going to end, whether they're going to turn into a full scale revolution or if they're going to die down, regardless of that, uh, the society is going to change so much that it's not going to be the same as it was a month ago. Uh, a lot of people already died, and they died for a um, political issue. They, they, everyone was extremely vocal by saying they don't want this government. Uh, I just don't see it coming back to where it started, regardless of the outcome. How did the? Oh, sorry. I, I, yeah, go ahead. No, how did the protests? Because you know, you did mention there were you know waves of of, of mass protests in the past. How did the, did those protests kind of died out? How, how come they were not successful? And what makes these protests mm -hmm. uh, different? Well, um, if we start from the two thousand and nine, which was a green movement, and which was the probably most the the most massive uh, protests in Iran, there were up to 2 million people in Tehran with certain days. Uh, nevertheless, that protest was asking to cancel or to revise the outcome of the election when Ahmadinejad was elected and he was the favor favorite of the supreme leader. I mean, there was um, no way the government would compromise. And they, they also asked for... Um, for something to change within the system. So they were not really targeting the roots of the problem. Uh, and also back then there were two leaders who unfortunately were not ready to lead and um, without the leaders, that was probably the first experience of Iranians uh, protesting in that scale and it died down. A lot of people got arrested. There were a lot of repressions and uh, there was their first experience, it died down. Now, 2017, 2018, 2019, uh, most of those protests, they were caused by economic problems, 
and uh, primarily primarily there were uh, people were unhappy about certain things in the economy for example 2019 the government uh, changed the price of petrol they tripled and people were some just couldn't make their ends meet and the, they were frustrated but of mm -hmm. course something like this cannot bring down the system because majority of the population is not going to come out and die on the street just because the petrol costs three times more. Uh, that's not something that they would be happy to die for. Um, today, I guess the issue is uh, uh, it just at its core, it's at the core of the system. So that's why it resonates with everyone because it resonates with the middle class who are unhappy, you know, because of their own reasons, because of the lack of freedom, uh, because of all the economic pressure they have to face because of the sanctions. Now, the poor people who are also unhappy, mostly because of the economic reasons. And uh, that's why today is probably the first time since the revolution in 1979 when it resonates with everyone. So that way, it has more chances for success. Of course, if certain conditions are fulfilled, like you know, uh, forming a vision of post-Islamic Iran, uh, developing a strategy, uh, forming some sort of a leadership sooner or later. Um, right. But yeah, I guess we cannot really say yes or no whether this is going to happen or not. This is, this is in the hands of Iranian people, but this time they do have a chance. Of course, it's up to us, up to them and up to us to see whether how it's going to develop and whether it's going to turn into something or not. Right. And, and um, I mean, we, we should, we're coming to a close here. So I will, I will, I will, I don't know uh, if there is anything that you think we haven't touched. Um, they would like to add. Um, I'll let you do that in a minute. The, I guess the only last question that I had, um, and I know we could do an episode only on that, but you know, let's just find who are the main allies of the Iranian regime abroad. Who 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 supports them, mm -hmm. and who has any influence on them? Uh, well, Iran has been. Uh, pretty limited in its uh, choice, Iranian regime. I mean, they have they have been pretty limited in their choice of allies. I would say that um, on a paper they have very few allies, which is uh, Russia, China. Uh, but they're more the more of a f allies of convenience. It's more of a marriage of convenience rather than natural allies. Uh, because Russia and Iran are um, natural uh, competitors uh, on the oil and gas market. And especially with the beginning of the war in Ukraine, uh, Russia was pushed out of the European markets. So they tried to reorient on China and India. And China and India have always been um, Iran's only market where of, because of the sanctions where they could uh, sell their oil. So right now, Iran is also pushed out of its only, uh, you know, market by their so-called ally. And Iran understands that. And um, But at the same time, they, they, because of their nature of the regime and things that are going on, they cannot really be an ally of the West. So they're like torn apart between and just try to be a, just to be ally with whoever they can at the moment um i guess it's a very similar um situation with china who yes iran was selling their oil and there's probably the biggest uh, partner iran had but at the same time i mean i guess we all know about chinese uh, policies uh, in the middle east and africa and china has been extremely aggressive when it comes to pushing policies that favor them and over the past few years iran did have to agree to some trade deals which uh, did not particularly favor iran but the favor chinese but 
Iran needed investment. So they agreed for it. But of course, they're not happy about this. So at the moment, I would say Iran has several allies, which are marriage of convenience, which is Russia, China, Venezuela, um, yeah. Venezuela as well. Um, but those are not really allies in an in a classical sense how we see it. And they're quite busy already in yeah, yeah exactly the, the plate exactly. And of course, they're not going to be helping Iran out. Uh, unless it's in their favor. Uh, I mean, you could see it with uh, uh, Russia, you could see it with China. I guess we can't really call Syria an ally because it's more of a, Iran is being more of a um, ally for Syria rather than Syria being ally for Iran. Um, right. Look, Thank you so much for this. This was incredibly interesting. I've, I've learned so much and I hope that everyone that listens and will be listening to us has learned as much as I have. Um, anything else you think is worth mentioning? Uh, I'm just going to say that I really hope that uh, things are going to turn for the better for Iranian people. Uh, and I really hope that they would get a chance this time. I mean, I know that things like this, uh, changing a oppressive regime, they don't happen overnight. And I know they tried for so many times. And I, I just really hope that uh, they're going to get the life they deserve instead of the, you know, misery and the <laughs> suffering they are right now. And we definitely share that wish. Um, thank you so much, Roxanne. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was really nice talking to you tonight. Thank you. And I'm sure everyone uh, will, 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 all our listeners will, will uh, thank, uh, I'm thanking you on behalf of all our listeners. Thank you so much. And thank goodbye, you. everyone. Goodbye.